Tastes. Good morning. Uh oh. Gonna give us five more minutes. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Let's make our way to the sanctuary. Let's stand together. Yes, Jesus. We come to praise and worship the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. Anybody? Amen. <laughs> Let's all stand together. Thank you, Father, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord Jesus, that you reign and you rule, Father, over all eternity. 
Lord, I'm just reminded that all creation sings your praises, Father, and that you said you inhabit the praises of your people. Lord Jesus, do not let... Don't let us let this time pass by without giving our hearts to you, Lord, in perfect surrender. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you, Father, for your provision. We thank you, Father, that you ought never leave us nor never forsake us. Thank you, Father, that you are a God that we can trust, Lord Jesus, that you died upon that cross and that you shed your blood, Father, that we may be saved, we may be healed, we may be delivered, Father. We don't have to live with iniquity. Lord, we don't have to live with bondage. We don't have to live with fear. We don't have to live with hopelessness, Lord, because your blood, your blood offers hope. Your blood offers healing. Your blood offers unending and undying love, Father, for your people. Lord, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're in this place. Thank you, Father, for your reckless love, Lord Jesus, that will that knows no end, Father, that knows no boundary, Lord Jesus. We just lift your name up high now. Father, Holy Spirit, just come into this place. Rise up within us, Father. Let our spirits rise, Father, that we might say you are holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Come on, let's just lift our hands to heaven this morning. Lord, we just give it all to you right now. We just give it all to you right now, Jesus. We look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. We give you praise. We give you praise and honor and glory is all yours, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus.
dragon, mountain you won't climb, but coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, now you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow, no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb, but coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, now you won't tear down.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you are a good, good Father. There you are, Father. I see you. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Father, that even when we don't love ourselves, Lord, that you are there loving on us. Lord, let's just open our hearts to him now. Let's just open our hearts to him now and receive his love. We receive your love. How good you are, Jesus. How good you are. How good you are. How good you are. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. How good you are, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. Oh, my days have been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. I love your voice. the fire in darkness night you were close like no other i known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God come on all my life all my you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh, I will sing of the goodness of God oh Down, I surrender. 
tell him what he means to you now. Just tell him what he means to you right now. Hallelujah. 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 Hey, put that first course up there. That first screen. No, no. Go to the next one. Right there. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been faithful. And can I tell you, even though a lot of things have took place over the last eight months, God has still been faithful. It says, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so good. We're talking about the Creator. We're talking about God, Jehovah Jireh. All my life. I cannot think of a day. cannot think of a moment. I cannot think of a time, Ricky, where he was not faithful and was not there when I needed him. Never, church, all my life you've been faithful. Let's sing that again. I want you to sing it this time like he's really been faithful. And I want you to be thankful for his faithfulness this morning. Come on, we're just going to, we're just going to breeze through it. I'm not, we're going to rush through it. We're going to sing it with meaning. All my life you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. Come on, like you mean it. Be thankful for his faithfulness. Come on. No, my life yes, there it is. Yes, sing it, church. Come on, church. Come on, mean it. No, my mean it. Life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I Oh, I 
of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. We sing of you, Lord. We sing of you, Lord. How good you are. How good you are. How good you are. How great. How mighty are you, Lord. How good, how great, how almighty are you, Lord. Oh, we sing of the Holy God. Oh, we sing of the Holy God. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Faithful are you, Lord. Faithful are you, Lord. Oh, loving are you, God. How loving are you, God. Holy. Holy, holy, holy. Who am I that I can be loved by such a holy God? Who are we that we can be loved by such a holy God? Oh, we thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for your love. Oh, thank you. Holy are you, Jesus. Holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Oh, we join in, Father, with praise and worship to our Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you don't cancel us. Lord, thank you, Father, that you don't dismiss us, Lord Jesus. You're always there, Father. Even when we turn away from you, Lord Jesus, you are always there. You're always there. So Faithful are you, Lord. Faithful are you, Lord. Faithful are you, Lord. I worship Jesus. How faithful are you, Lord. Faithful are you, Lord. Faithful are you, Lord.
day I need you more More than words could say I need you more Than ever before I need you Lord I need you Lord I need you more I need you more song I sing more than the next heartbeat more than anything and Lord as time goes by I'll be by your side cause I never want to go back to my old life I need you
Just sing it out. More than yesterday, I need you more. More than words to say, I need you more. Than ever before, I need you, Lord. I need you. I think that's a song that says pretty much what's on everybody's mind and on our hearts in here this morning. We need Him more every day. And as time goes on, we're going to need Him more and more. We're going to lean on Him more and more. But I want to address something this morning right quick. God has put this on my heart over the past couple of days. Of course, when He puts something on your heart, He's usually dealing with you and what's going on with you. And that's the issue of a bitter heart. Now, I've never been one to hold grudges. Had a lot of things happen to me in my life, and I just, you know, okay, whatever. That's between you and God. That's the way I figure it. But as this political season comes into play, and we start taking sides as to who we want to be in office and such as this, we start building a little bitterness in our hearts against the, we'll call it, opposition to whatever we believe. So this morning, as I say, we need Him more each and every day. But it, God has just shown me that we're carrying some bitterness in our hearts and we might not even realize it. It could be something as small as uh, something that happened 10 years ago or a family situation. Lord knows the enemy likes to use our family to get next to us. He, he likes to use the things closest to us. So this morning, search your hearts. I'm serious about this. This is, this is serious. As this time draws closer and closer, we really have to focus on what Jesus is requiring of us. Jesus' last words on the cross was, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He held no bitterness in his heart, and look what he went through. So this morning, if there's a heaviness in your heart from this, I want you to come. We want to take this opportunity to pray with you and to get this burden off of you. So won't you come this morning?
never know where somebody's at when they walk in these doors. You never know the struggle they've had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You never know what they've been carrying for months. And a simple, simple song that says, I need you more, can bring so much freedom. If you acknowledge that you need more of him, it says more than yesterday, more than words can say, but I say more than yesterday and not as much as I need you tomorrow. Because I'm going to need you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need you tomorrow. I'm going to need you the next day. I'm going to need you every day. Listen. Breaking strongholds. Breaking bondage. Breaking chains. But when there's freedom, church, there'll be freedom. When there's freedom, there'll be freedom. when he breaks it he breaks it Father we thank you this morning we thank you for breakthrough we thank you God for what you're doing we thank you Lord for your mighty mighty touch upon your people this morning Thank you. 
you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. got to understand something. We need to catch this. When the enemy's coming and putting bondage and putting chains and putting doubts and fears and there's a release in your life, you got to choose to walk in that release. You got to choose to walk in that freedom. You can't keep letting the enemy just bring everything back on you over and over. When you're free, listen, the Bible says when the sun sets free, it's free indeed. You can't continue to let him keep on because he will keep bringing it. He's not going to stop. Understand when there's freedom, when there's a release, got to choose this day to walk in that freedom because it's going to be real easy to get back into that bondage so easy so easy but God's trying to bring freedom complete freedom to his people what the enemy's trying to do God's trying to turn it for the good. We have to make the choice. Today, I walk in freedom. You know, there's a phrase that used to be, I've heard it said many, many times. I used it this morning in Sunday school. And, I, uh, and we used to say it a lot, but I haven't heard it lately. But we don't fight our battles for victory, church. We fight our battles from victory. I think you shared something on that. And, I, and it hit me when I seen it. I said, we don't hear that much anymore. We fight from victory. We don't fight to get it. We fight. The victory, the battle's already been won. We don't fight just to get victorious. We're already victorious. And we're fighting for from victory don't let the enemy kill still and destroy the things that God is birthing in your spirit in these days that we're in don't let the enemy steal it don't let him take it don't let him distract you don't let him hold you because if he can get you in a place he will chain you there and he will throw away the key but there's still power in the blood and there's still freedom. Jesus is still setting the captive free. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for freedom. Freedom in Christ. Freedom in the blood. Freedom in the spirit. Freedom in power. We thank you this morning. Lord, we thank you for those you've touched in this altar at this prayer time. Lord, those that are watching on Facebook, we lift you up. 
Maybe you're fighting that, that, that bitterness. Maybe you're fighting that bondage. Maybe you're fighting that, that hurt, that pain. You're free this morning by the blood of Jesus and by the power of God. If you would just stake your freedom and choose to walk in it. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in this house. Lord, we pray over our president and his wife. God, for their healing. Lord, for vision, for clarity. For, Lord, for, for encouragement. Lord, we, we encourage him this morning. God, we pray over our leaders from all levels, national to local. We pray over our military, their families, firefighters, police officers, first responders, their families. God, we just, we thank you this morning. We thank you this morning. Now, Father, continue to move and to bless your people as we move through this service today. As we pray for our children. And as we move forward, what we do as we take communion this morning and we receive the tithes and offerings. And Lord, as your, I need your anointing for the word this morning. But God, your spirit is in this place and your spirit is doing a work. And we ask God that it will continue to move, continue to flow. Through everything that is done, we give you praise, glory, and honor. Your children would come this morning, CJ. Father, we pray uh, as we do every single week, Lord, for these students, these kids, Lord. Yeah. We pray, Lord, that you just pour out your anointing on them, Lord, Absolutely. that you just uh, touch their homes, touch their uh, lives, Lord. Lord, you have a plan and a purpose for them, Lord. And, Lord, we just ask that you they can just seek it and they will just follow in you know, your plan and your purpose, Lord. Lord, we praise you for these kids. Lord, Lord, we thank you for um, them coming here, Lord. Lord, it's not by chance they're here. It's not by chance their parents are here, Lord. But, Lord, we praise you and we thank you for these kids, Lord. Lord, I pray that you just touch them in their school. Lord, that um, they, you give them the knowledge, the understanding, the peace, Lord, that they can do it, Lord, that they can pass every single class, that can, they can witness to people. Lord, we just uh, thank you for that, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Back if the men come, it's going to be serving communion this morning. The first Sunday of the month, we always set aside to do communion. Communion is just uh, bread and crackers and juice that represents the body and the blood of Jesus. It's a uh, communion that we take as we're partaking of these elements to partaking of him, to be joined with him, to be in communion with him. And um, we just ask you to hold all the elements. Nobody, you can let the plate pass you. There's no judgment in this house. Hold all the elements. Parents, if you want your children to partake, that is your discretion there. You do that on your own. Uh, but hold the elements that everybody's been served and we'll partake together. Guys, would you serve the body, please?
I received of the Lord that which I delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. We'd given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this. Remembrance of me. Kim, would you bless the bread, please? Take the bread together, please. In the same manner, he took the cup. After he had supper, saying, this cup, listen, is a new covenant. In my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Tommy, would you bless the cup, please? Father, thank you for shedding your blood that washes away all our sins. No matter how deep or how long we stay in sin, it's still washing away. And Lord, we thank you for being willing to die on that cross for us. Protect the cup together. Paul says in this passage, he says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I'm going to add to it, he's coming soon. Amen. Ushers, would you come please? Yes. Absolutely. Brag on God. I love it. You need to.
It's just out of obedience. And all we're giving today is out of obedience. And God, I ask you to bless the giver, bless the gift. Multiply it. Further your kingdom. But God, as I pray every week, and I'm sincere, help us be good stewards with what people sow into this church for this, for your kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Would you bring your tithes and offerings, please? couple of Sundays. By the way, I just want to make a, a huge announcement. Um, my wife's been sick for about a week and a half, two weeks now. Been treating her for bronchitis, and she was tested the other day for COVID, which all of you know came back negative. 
tested because of her history and stuff with her lungs and clots and things like that. But, but she's doing better. I told her to stay home today, not to try to overdo it. She's supposed to return to work tomorrow, but thank you for your prayers. We're grateful. But I also want to announce to you tonight at 5 o'clock, we resume our Sunday night services. Five is for prayer. Five o'clock is prayer. And at six o'clock, we're going to start having, we're going to have our Sunday night service. I'm so excited for this. I do not want you to be under any, any indication that God told me if we have Sunday night, he's going to do this because God did not say that. This is something he's been doing with me for over a year and a half. And I'm finally, finally doing what he said. Um, I believe in the times that we're in, we need to be in church more than we are less. Um, I know there's a struggle. I know that, listen, when we quit having Sunday night services, a lot of people had to adjust. They were even going to other churches that had it because they were so used to going. It was just the norm. It was, uh, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to be normal, but I'm just trying to tell you that we had to adjust from when everybody stopped to quit going. I know it's going to be adjustment to start back going, and I, and, I, and I understand that, but I'm here to tell you, I've already told the Holy Spirit, I've already told God, I said, God, if there's three people there, I will preach like it's 3,000. Because it doesn't matter to me who's in the building. It does matter. I want as many people that can get here. But I've already had people asking me when we were going to start back because their church is not doing it, and they want to come be a part of a Sunday night church. They may not show up tonight. They may, it may take them a week, but, and they may. I don't know. But this is for our church and for anybody else that wants to have Sunday night church service. Amen? Tonight at 5, we'll start with our prayer, and then we'll start service at 6 o'clock with praise and worship, and then we'll let the Spirit do what it's going to do. But the next few Sundays, including tonight and probably next Sunday night, I'm going to be preaching on the topic revival <laughs> and you know we, we're going to be in revival in November but I'm not going to be preaching on that kind of revival I love revival services I, I, I remember going up as a kid uh, you know back in the days when I was a kid revival lasted from Sunday to Sunday it went Sunday morning to the next Sunday and, and including Friday night <laughs> and Saturday night and uh I remember going just about every night uh, uh, because my mom said, we're going to church. You didn't argue. You just got ready and went to church. And uh, it's, um, I, and it, things are different. When I was candidating for this church to become pastor, uh, I was talking to uh, the district office about revivals and evangelists and, and a he didn't laugh. He said, Jeff, it's not that way anymore. I said, what do you mean? He said, most revivals now are Sunday morning and Sunday night, or most of them are Sunday to Wednesday. Because I'm still thinking old school. I'm still thinking these guys book a whole week, you know, you know, a week or sometimes two weeks out. And he said, it's not that way anymore. And he said, actually, a lot of churches don't even have revivals anymore. And through the pandemic, it's even slowed down even more so. I'm not preaching it because I think we're dead. I know people think the word revival means revive. I'm not think, preaching it because I think we're dead. I'm preaching it because I think we need more of God than we ever needed in our lives. Amen. I've got a few books here, and this one is called uh, Revival Sermons. It's by, it's by Bill Bright and some other different people have different comments. This particular chapter is called Three Phases of Revival, and I just want to read a little insert that this guy, uh, Gordon Anderson, wrote. He said, what is revival? What does, the, what does one look like? For many, the, the word revival creates an image of a long, of long, emotional, powerful church services where people worship with enthusiasm, pray with passion, and reach out in faith and see the power God demonstrated in new and unique ways. This might be generally true, but I believe revival is much more than that. 
I define revival as a period of time when people awaken to the reality of a God who is always present and always willing to work on behalf of his kingdom through his people. When people awaken to, to God and, and begin to con conduct themselves as though God is truly present, things begin to happen. Schedules, priorities change, sinners are converted, saints are sanctified, people are called into ministry, church services come alive, and the power of God is revealed in new and thrilling ways. Pretty good, right? This particular guy here is named Leonard Ravenhill. He wrote this book called My Revival Terry's. He wrote another book. He wrote many, but he wrote another one called Revival God's Way. And in this particular book, in this, in this particular book, he, I have a lot of stuff highlighted that he said. And he said the Cinderella of the church of today is the prayer meeting. This handmaid of the Lord is unloved and unwooed because she is not dripping with the pearls of intellectualism. Nor glamorous with the skills of philosophy. Neither is she enchanting with the tiara of psychology. She wears the homespins of sincerity and humility and so is afraid to kneel. The tragedy of this late hour is that we have too many dead men in the pulpits giving out dead sermons to dead people. This is Leonard Ravenhill now. A sermon born in the head reaches the head, but a sermon born in the heart reaches the heart. Unction cannot be learned, only earned by prayer. The prayer meeting is dead or dying by our attitude to pray, to tell God what, is, what was begun in the spirit, we can finish it in the flesh. What church ever asks, it, listen to this, listen to this statement. What church ever, what church ever asks its candidate ministries, minister, what time, how much time he spent in prayer? They look at credentials, they look at the, his church growth record, they look at how many, what kind of preacher he is, they look at his personality, is he, is he, uh, Ongoing, he's, he's, a person, he's a people person. They look at his, uh, his, his record, his track record. How, many, how long was he at this church? How long was that church? They never get interviewed to say, Pastor or potential pastor, how long do you spend in prayer? It might make a difference. By the way, they did ask me that here. Just so y'all know. Yet ministers who do not spend two hours a day in prayer are not worth a dime, a dime or a dozen degrees or no degrees. Did you hear what he said? Two hours? He's talking to ministers now. Y'all can just listen. The devil has substituted reincarnation for a regeneration, familiar spirits for the Holy Spirit, Christian science for divine healing, the Antichrist for the true Christ, and the Church of Rome for the true church. I'm going to stop there because it's just going to get worse and worse if I keep reading. I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Yeah, we know that verse. But today, I'm going to try my best. And I, and I know sometimes I get, I say some humorous things and, you know, and, and humor is okay. But today, I want to share my heart with you. I'm just going to pour out my heart with you. I just want you to understand. I want you to stay with me. And I want you to hear me this morning. As I look back at the last 10 years of this church, I ask myself this question, are we making an impact? When I first got to this church, one of the questions was asked to me in a meeting with some other ministers. They asked, they asked this question, not directly to me, but they made a general question. They said, if your church closed tomorrow, would, the community, would it affect the community? And I didn't really know how to answer that because I just got here. I didn't know. But if you look at me now and ask me that question now, I'd have to tell you no. And it breaks my heart. It saddens me. Oh, oh Pastor, we're not, we're not a good church? Yeah, we're a good church. We're not the best we can be, though. Maybe we have to ask ourselves that question. Am I making an impact? If you've asked that, then how are you different now than you were when we, first, when, we, when we first got here? Or how am I different now? Would your answer reflect a positive or negative change? I've had a vision for this church since we got here for revival. We've had several revivals in this church. We've had several ministers, evangelists come through and preach. 
Sundays through Wednesdays, and, and, and you know, and, and we've had some powerful moves of God, and we've had some things happen, and, you know, but there's been no after fruit. A revival into a, in a church should not change a church, it should affect a city. Are you with me? Are you, listen, don't sit there and be quiet to me, or I'll preach for five hours. There we got somebody on the right path. Listen, I have a burden for revival. I, I really have a sense. I'm not talking about what's coming in November. I love Dr. Todd. Tim is an amazing friend of mine, a powerful man of God, an anointing man of God. You're gonna, your life's going to be touched. God's going to move in your life. I promise you, don't miss this revival coming up in November. But I'm not talking about that revival. I want revival. I don't have any perceived notion of what it looks like. I haven't sat down and said, God, show me what revival looks like. I haven't sat there and said, okay, I need a diagram of what. No, I, 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 know, I know Tim's going to come. Tim's got messages he's going to preach. He may have preached them, one of them 10 years ago. He may have a brand new one. I don't know. But I know when he delivers it, he's going to have an anointing on his life. And God's going to move and God's going to respond to his word. But I don't know. I don't have a perceived notion. The only revival I've ever experienced <laughs> is the personal revival that takes place in my life. I've been to other meet revivals. I'm not just going to call them meetings. They're called revivals. But I'm telling you, the best revival I've ever had is the one that happened in my own life. When nobody was present but me and God. There was not a big crowd. There was not a lot of music. There was not even an offering taken that day. It was just me and him. And I'm going to tell you something. I received more than he did. It's those times where... <laughs> it's those personal times. I believe that there are certain elements that will accompany a, a real, genuine revival. But I know that revival here at New Life Assembly or in Griffin, Georgia, is not going to look anything like the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola. It's not going to look anything like the Toronto uh, Revival, the Toronto Blessing. It's not going to look like any other revival in any other church you've been in. Because listen, what I want in this church and what I want in this city is a real move of God that changes the lives of people that come encounter with it. But you ask the question, well, Pastor, how do we get there? And I'm going to tell you how. We get to that revival by getting back to the altar in the church. Amen. What's the purpose? What does the Bible say about altars? You stay where you are in Chronicles. The first mention of an altar goes back to Genesis chapter 8, where God brought Noah and his family through the flood, and Noah built an altar, and he worshiped God there. In Genesis 12, God called Abram out of the land of idolatry into a promised land, a new place. Abraham, Abram built an altar there, and he called on the name of the Lord. Abraham was called to sacrifice his own son, and he built an altar. God was taken into a new place of obedience. Isaac built an altar. Jacob built an altar. Moses built altars. Joshua built altars. Every time there was an altar built, God was preparing to take an individual, a family, or a nation to a place they'd never been before, a deeper revelation of who God is and what God wanted to do with them. This takes me to our passage this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Solomon had just finished building the temple. And when he was finished praying, fire came down from heaven and he consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of God filled the temple. This is in the first part. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of God filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down from, and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, He is Good. His love endures forever. In verse 8, Solomon is 
observed the, the, the festival at the time for seven days and all of Israel with him. In verse 9, on the eighth day they had an assembly for they had celebrated the dedication of the altar for seven days and the festival for seven, seven more days. The altar was placed was a place of sacrifice. It was a place to connect with God. It was a place to find God's will. It was a place of worship. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord, of the Lord in the royal palace, and he had succeeded in, and succeeded in carrying out all in, all he had in mind to do for the temple of the Lord, the Lord appeared to him at night and he said, "I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for my temple, for myself as a temple for sacrifices." In verse 13, he says, When I shut up the heavens so there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among people. In other words, when it, lo when it looks like uh, as though destruction has come, we'll never see the good times. Again, when it appears as though the world has overcome the church instead of the other way around, when it seems as though revival will never come. Let me tell you something. We're in a time and a place in our society where, listen, the world is trying to overcome the church. And the problem we have is the church is letting it happen. The church is bowing down its head and tucking its head down saying, oh, we surrender, we give up, we wave the white flag. Let me tell you something. The church better get back on her knees so she can stand tall when the world comes again and, and, and we got to come against what man is trying to tell us to do. Revival, listen, revival is not just some series of uh, sermons and preaching. Oh, that's great. The power of God is wonderful. Revi We're going to have a great time in November. But I want to tell you something. Revival needs to be here before he ever lands a plane in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. If my, he says, listen, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then... I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I know this verse was very popular when coronavirus hit. I've seen it posted all the time. I heard it quoted from many, many people. But I'm telling you, it's time to get serious about this verse. There's, a four steps in, there's some steps in there to real revival. We've got to humble ourselves. We've got to pray. We've got to seek God's face. And we've got to turn from our wicked ways. Oh, little pastor, are you saying that we're a sinful church? No, I'm telling you, no, we're not. But we got wicked ways. Oh, pastor, we're God's people. You still got wicked ways. We've allowed things to take place. We've allowed things to come against us. We've allowed things to tell us how to be church, what church should look like, how church should act, when to have church, when not to have church. We're told by the society today and our government today, you can only have so many people in your building. You've got to wear a mask everywhere you go. You've got to be six foot apart. Let me tell you something. I don't see nowhere in the Bible where God ever separated his people from one another. I see where God put his people together and draw them together and, and confine for them to be together. Because listen, he said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in the midst of them. We need revival, but revival is not going to start out there in the street. Revival is not going to start there on some stage. Revival is not going to start somewhere in a building. Revival is going to start at an altar in your heart. And if it don't start there, it's never going to come. Oh, pastor, but that's your call. You're the one that calls revival. No, I don't. That's God's call. I just, I'm just going along with it. I was not going to have revival this year. I didn't think revival was even going to be possible. But I'm sitting on my bed and I'm watching the video. I'm watching this man preach. And the Holy Spirit said, bring him in. I said, God, he can't come in. of coronavirus. He goes, bring him in. You think, I'm worried about a virus? Bring him in. So that's why he's coming. But I want to tell you something. R revival will begin at the altar. Number one, the altar is good for God's people. He said, if my people are called by my name. He said, if my people who are called by my name. He wasn't talking to worldly people. He wasn't talking to ungodly people. He said, if my people who are called by my name. That's talking about you and me. That's talking about us today. It's talking about Christians. It's talking about those that are followers of Christ, those that have accepted Christ. 
Those that are born again. The people who claim the name of Jesus. We are all, we are God's agents of change on earth. Do you know you're a change agent? You're a change agent. God's put a, something in you to make a difference in somebody else. We are the ones whom God is counting on to change the culture. Instead, it appears that the culture is having more influence on the church than the other way around. See, when Jesus left his church in the hands of 12 disciples, 12 apostles, when he left this, when he sent it back, the church was in their hands. I read, I read, a, I read a, a, I was reading a book, there was a little insert in it. It was just a little paraphrase, and it was when Jesus went back to heaven, when he ascended back, everybody asked him, hey, how was earth? What was it like down there? What was those people like? Oh, yeah, we know it was okay. It was this, it was that, you know. And, you know, they, uh, what about your disciples? Yeah, you know, what are, you know, I left the church in their hands. Yeah, but Jesus, what if they fail? He said, they can't. There's no plan B. Can I tell you something? The disciples are in heaven. The church is in our hands. That changes perspective, don't it? If the church fails, we failed. God didn't fall. We fell. If the church does not come out victorious and stand at the end and, and, and is celebrated and crowned as God's bride, then, then somebody has failed. There may, listen, there, there are churches. <clears throat> churches should be like Dollar Generals and be on every corner. There's probably one in Mars, I don't know. But the church should be everywhere. I don't think, I don't see why churches can't be everywhere. As long as you're Bible believing, Bible teaching, God fearing church. I'm not talking about some doctrine out there that's erroneous and crazy and, and out there and just full of garbage. I'm talking real word of God preaching. If we get churches like that in our community, and there are a lot of them here in other communities, I'm going to tell you something. It's the church that will change the world. The world can never change the church. We need revival. We need revival. See, we are people of power. The power of the Holy Spirit is at work in us. The power to overcome every trick of the enemy and to make a difference in a lost and dying world. We are the ones who are called by his name. We are called by my people who are called by my name. We are his people called by his name. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, Praise to be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Verse 4 says, He chose us to, in love before the in, He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He, he predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given to us and the ones he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. We are his people, church. He may have been talking to Solomon in this book. He may have been talking to those that were around in this time. But I'm telling you, if you translate that to 2020, God is speaking to his church today and saying, if my people who are, who call, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will heal your land. Let me tell you something. He's still waiting for the church to humble itself, to seek his face and to turn from his ways and to pray. And then God can move. The second thing for the altar, the altar is for prayer. If they'll humble themselves and pray and seek my face. You see, today, in the, in the, in the modern society of church building, it's the elaborate mega church is the standard. I have nothing wrong with it. I have nothing wrong with a nice, big, big building with all the fancy stuff. I have no issue with it. As long as the word of God's being preached and lives are being changed, then it's a productive church. But when, when, when the media gets in the way and the media becomes more important, 
it becomes an issue for me. But I'm going to tell you, in a lot of these big, new, modern-style churches, when the sanctuary is built, there's one thing they don't put in it, and it's called an altar. It's not there anymore. I read a story of a pastor who came to a church, decent-sized church. It was, wasn't real big in a, in a very rural area. And he got to the church, and he noticed in the church Everything was kind of trying to change the modern. They had the benches out. They had chairs. But there was an old wooden altar across the front of the church. Just an old, I mean, old. Didn't even match the building. It was so old. And they started having real powerful moves of God. He was, he, he was leaking revival like every other pastor. And <laughs> people started being baptized in the spirit people started shouting all over the church people started being slain in the spirit God started doing wonders and miracles and signs and man things were happening and he's like wow man this thing's is, this is amazing what we're going to do he said he took the altar out because they needed more room and he began to and he said services kept happening things kept going on but he started feeling something was missing and he said, God, you're blessing. We're growing. But what's different? I, I still see people being saved. I still see people being healed. I still see people being filled. People are being slain in the spirit. You're doing a work. What is missing? But something's missing. He said, you removed the centerpiece of revival. And that's the altar. That's where it all begins. Listen. Most people... Are praying people. Even people that aren't godly are praying people because I see it on Facebook. I'm praying for you. Oh, Jesus. For the most part, we don't put a great emphasis on corporate prayer. I don't know how much or how long you fervently you or how seriously you pray. And that's not my business. That's between you and God. But I don't want, but I don't want someone praying for me that's not going to be able to touch heaven. We pray in the power of the Spirit. We pray knowing that God hears and answers prayer. But I want you to take a look at what God says should happen before you pray. You must humble yourself. I'm going to tell you something that I think is just sickening, and that's arrogant prayers. People who think they are so big and so spiritual and so mighty and so godly that they come down with these arrogant prayers and, and they think these elaborate words and they get up there and, and they just try to put on a show for themselves. Let me tell you something. There was two people who went before Jesus to pray and one of them humbled himself and said, I'm a sinner. I'm not even worthy. And that man went home blessed. The Hebrew word translated as humble means to be brought low. To be in subjection to another. So when we humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face in essence, what, are we, what we are doing is praying God's will and not our own desire. Church, when we get back to praying what God wants and not what pastor wants or not what you want or not what they want or not what he wants or not what she wants, when we get back to praying what God desires and what God wants and praying the will of God, God will start moving and answering. God cannot answer my prayer when Jeff is about the prayer. God, you called me. You said you were going to do this, and I'm the pastor, so you, you got to. Yeah, I put you there. I can move, remove you from there too, son. Like my wife used to tell my son, I brought you in the world. I can take you out of the world. <laughs> God said, I put you there. I can take you out of there. It's my will to be done, not yours. It's my desire to be accomplished, not yours. He says he'll give us desires of our heart if our desires line up with his will. It's got to be about God's will. Does God's, is God wanting to bring revival? Absolutely he is. But he can't bring it if the church is not ready to receive it. And if the church hasn't done the proper steps to understand it. And if you've taken, listen, I'm not criticizing churches for having, not having an altar. I'm criticizing churches for not promoting an altar. If you don't have a, an old fi fi fancy altar, then you got some place to come up and kneel. But nowadays, would you just raise your hand 
and they say this prayer. Oh, I'm about to get in some serious hot water. I'm not knocking big, 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 big gatherings. I'm not. But I'm telling you something. When I had an encounter at the altar with Jesus, it was a real encounter. I don't think me raising my hands back there in that church, in that church chair that Sunday morning, I don't think me raising my hands would have done what I needed in my life. I had to have an encounter. I had to have a touch. I had to have a revelation. I needed deliverance. I needed saving. I needed a savior. I needed a king. I needed the Lord. And I needed him then. And just saying words was not going to be good enough. Listen, I don't know about you, but the day that I came to that nailed to that cross and I, and I surrendered my life I could not stop weeping I could not stop crying oh there was joy of the Lord there but it was the sadness and the sorriness that I had because of what I had done to him and what I had done because of what he had done for me and I had rejected it I was sad listen today people aren't afraid of sin they're just afraid they're going to get caught come on church where are you at today So it's for prayer. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to, to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. If there's no transformation of the mind, there's no knowing what God's will is. Number three, the altar is for repentance. Repentance. If you turn from your wicked ways, I wonder what secular society is doing to change this, the need for repentance in the lives of Christians. They're trying to, uh, to sanitize it. They're trying to, they're trying to find some way to, to where if you just do some right, if you just do some good things, you'll be okay. There's no true repentance anymore. There's no people sorry for their sins anymore. There's no people that, listen, there may be some sinners out there that radically get saved, and I'm telling you, and you know it, but there's church people that have been saved for years that have gotten a little bit lukewarm, a little bit cold, and they've, and they've wandered, and God's saying, I'm trying to get to your heart. I need you to repent. I love you. You're not backslidden, but you've got something in your life that needs to get away. But the church says, no, no, I've been doing this for years. I got it. <laughs> but God's saying there's an altar for you it's repentance if the church will not repent the world will never understand repentance I'm not, I was, I'm not good enough I'm not smart enough I, I don't I don't have enough. I don't, I, don't, I don't have what it takes. I, none of us do. My Bible says that my righteousness is filthy rags. I have nothing to offer God but myself. And God doesn't want nothing but me. He doesn't want me to bring anything with me. He doesn't want me to bring, have tag along anything. Listen, a pastor friend of mine, a very good pastor friend of mine, said he had a dream one time, and it scared him to death, and he still talks about it, and he's, still, and he's wondering today if that dream was prophetic when he had it so, mo so many years ago about right now because he said he dreamed, and he saw a bunch of people gathering together. They were a bunch of people, and he said he noticed they were standing like this. And he goes, like, why are they standing like that? That is weird. That's a weird way to stand. And he looked up. They was holding on to Jesus here, up to Jesus here, but they had the world here. And God said they got to let go of one because they can't take the world with them. And he said he noticed people doing this. Just letting go. Because the world meant so much more. We're in the time. Is Jesus coming tomorrow? I don't know. Is he coming next week? I don't know. Is he coming soon? Yes. When soon? I don't know. You look it up. But he's coming. 
How do I know he's coming? Because in the Mount of Transfiguration, when he ascended into heaven, the angel said, while you stand here gazing, he's going to come back the way he came. They came off the mountain 2,000 years ago and said, Jesus is coming back. So if he's coming back then, he's got to be coming back still. And he said, listen, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, but I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Guess what? If he said he's going to go, he said, I'm going to come back. Well, he went, right? Yes. Has he come back? No. Not yet. But there are people, there are people that would rather, rather keep what they have here than to let it go and go with him. There are people that would rather hold on to this world than to give it up. And follow Jesus. You know, there's, there's an old saying, I've, and I've, I've even heard somebody use it, that you know what? Just suppose you're right, and there's no Jesus, and he's not going to come back, and you live a great life. What have you lost? But just suppose I'm right, and there is a Jesus, he has come back, and you miss him, and you go to hell. Then, what's the stakes? See, the altar's for repentance. It's not just, it's not just for prayer. And what was the first one? It's not just for God's people, it's for repentance for all people. Listen, my point is this, when we examine our lives, do we do, we, do, we do so in comparison with the lives of sinners or in the comparison with, uh, with him who is perfect? If we compare our, ourselves to those in the world, most times you'll come out smelling like a rose. But if you compare yourself with a perfect man, you realize that your ways are wicked and there is, there is a need of repentance. Allow me to share something with you. Norm, we normally think of sin concerning things we have done that we shouldn't have. But as you need to repent for things you have not done that you should have. To him to know to do good and do it not to him, it's sin. That's what the Bible says. As you take steps forward, general, uh, as you take steps forward, um, we, we, need to, uh, we need to make sure that we are doing things according to God's plans, that we are, that we are just, uh, that we are doing what he wants, that we are pursuing how he wants us to pursue, that we are obeying how he wants us to obey. If we're not going to use the altar for repentance, then we need to get rid of the altar. That probably should have been number one, but listen. It's God's plans that we are following. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. And verse 9 says, And the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than yours. Number four, the altar is for assurance. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin. Psalms 86, 7 says, In the day of my trouble, I will call to you, for you will answer me. We're, we're almost there. We're almost there. Isn't it comforting to know that when God forgives you, you are forgiven? When God forgives you, you're forgiven. Is there any doubt? If there's any doubt, it's because you haven't forgiven yourself. God hears your prayer. He sees a repentant heart, and he forgives your sin. You see, everybody always talks about David, 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 the great man, great man, great man. David was an awesome, an awesome man, the greatest king Israel ever had. But David had, David had sin in his life. He even said, my sins before me, talking about his son. David committed adultery with a married woman. David had a man killed in a, in a war. But yet God had enough in him to say, you're a man after my own heart, David. Because David understood what repentance meant. David wasn't ashamed to repent in public. David wasn't ashamed to repent to God. David wasn't ashamed. And David made, David made sure that when he repented, that he turned away from it. You see, when we talk about repentance, repentance is turning away. You know, I tell people, they're like, well, I'm going to make a 180-degree turn. I said, 
I want, no, they said, I'm going to make a 360 degree turn. I said, don't turn 360 degrees. Let's turn it all the way back around. Turn 180 and go the other way. Just turn half of that and go the other way. If you turn back around, you're facing back where you were. I know that's just a play on numbers, but repentance is turning away and see what we've done. And, and, and this is where I think overall the church, and I'm not talking about individual families or people. I'm talking about the body of Christ. What we have done, we have allowed sin to dominate our church. Because now we say it's okay. Why do I always do this? It's okay if we put a homosexual in a class to teach. It's okay, pastor. I, I know they're living together, but it's okay if they teach the young adults. They, they got good hearts. <laughs> Two occasions in this church, I preached on that. And I had a couple come to me and want to sit down and talk. <laughs> and they're like, we, understood, we heard you Sunday. I'm like, okay. Well, you got, you got questions about it? I'm like, well, is there a problem with it? Well, yeah, there is. I'm like, okay. I thought, well, here you go, Pastor. Here's your first chance. And... They said, the, first, the question was, do you really feel that way? I said, absolutely. I said, according to the Bible, that if you are having sex outside of marriage, you're fornicating, and it's a sin to God. I said, if you're living together as husband and wife, you're not married, I said, it's a sin before God. I said, you're welcome to stay in this church as long as you want to stay, but you'll never be in leadership. You'll never have any responsibilities in ministry because you can't minister to people when you're living in, a bitch, in, in open sin. You really feel that way? I said, yes, I do. And, and, I, and I can prove it with the Bible. No, we understand. Then will you do something? I said, what? Will you marry us? Yes. Twice that happened. Twice. So I'm like, yes. Right now? <laughs> well, no, we can't do it now. I said, then you can't go back home together. I said, if you're going to accept Christ and, live, and, and repent and live for Christ, you're going to have to find other, have no, other ways to live besides together. Not a problem. And it happened. No, unfortunately, one of those marriages didn't last, but the other one's still going strong. So. But the divorce is not my fault, so I can't take credit for that. <laughs> then number five, the altar is for healing. I will heal their land. How does God want to heal our land? Listen, to you, I'm going to tell you, it's, it's, been a, it's been a crazy, crazy last eight months. And I read an article yesterday by, I don't even know that doctor's name. What's his name? Who? Is it Fauci? Fauci? What's his name? Fauci? Yeah, the, the, the doctor, the dude, the big guru guy. Somebody asked you a question and said, hey, how long is this going to continue? He said, probably for another year. Social distancing and wearing masks. I said, maybe for you, pal, not for me. But anyway. And I'm like, man, you see, somebody's going to grab a hold of that, and they're going to live on that, and they're going to put fear in their life, and they're going to hinge on that. Everything, listen, everything that this man says you don't hinge your hat on it. Because most of these people are saying what the media wants you to hear. You know, I, I, wa I was watching the news, or I was watching something yesterday, and they had a news break. And the, the first news channel said, it was the doctor from the hospital where Trump's at, and he said, well, he's, he's fever-free for 24 hours. Uh, he's not on oxygen. He's, uh, he's talking very good. He's in good spirits. He actually told us while we were doing our rounds up, upstairs that uh, he could probably walk out of that place and go home today. The next, immediately I flipped the channel, the next news break. Uh, the next 40 hours are critical. He's on oxygen, and his, and his vitals are very bad. What in the world, people? That's what we're getting. That's where we're at. But let me tell you, 
what the church has allowed to happen, what the church has replaced the gospel with, what the church has replaced the anointing with. Listen, there's too many people, too many so-called preachers or whatever you want to call them. Listen, they'd rather have the attention than the anointing. They'd rather have the attention than the anointing. They'd rather be in all about hype than about holiness. Why don't we hear anything on holiness anymore? Without holiness, which no man shall see God. We don't talk about holy living anymore. Respectable living, holy living. They've, tra they've traded, they've turned in. Grace for greasy grace. They've made grace a license to sin, and Paul said, no, forbid. They, 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 they've, they've made it where everything is acceptable. Come to our church. We're free will. <laughs> yeah, you are. A little bit too much for me. They, they, they appoint people in leadership positions that have no business in those positions only because they're trying to please the people and they're trying to satisfy their bank account. I said it and I'll say it again. If you're preaching this gospel to get rich, you need to get out of the game and go find something else to do because you're damaging the gospel. The Bible says it's not for personal gain. If you're prostituting this book, shame on you. You need to repent and give your heart back to Jesus. Because if you're trying to sell this book, you are nowhere near his child. I got to finish. First of all, we have to stop and think of how our land is sick. We're sick spiritually. We are sick physically. We're sick emotionally. But at the time of the altar can bring healing to every area of your life. The altar can bring healing if the church will get back to the altar and God will heal our land. But it's got to take place here. Acts 15, 16 through 18, 16, it says, um, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent in its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. 17 says that the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things. 18 says that have, have been known for ages. So the question is, do you want revival? Do you really want revival? Revival came to North, North China in 1932 in answer to several prayers several years of prayers, at one point, Norwegian missionary Maria Monson uh, wondered what, God, what good her praying could do. She longed to see God's river of life flood spiritually dry China. Then she realized that the mighty river, uh, Yangtze, whatever it's called, river began with tiny drops of rain come together in the top of the mountains. Maria sought a prayer partner who would join her in claiming the promise that if two or three agreed on anything, or concerning anything they ask, it will be done by them by my Father in heaven. Matthew 18, 19. When she finally found someone, she exclaimed, the waking has begun. The two of us have agreed. The raindrops of revival prayer were coming together. In November of 1930, in 1930 she announced... A great revival is coming soon. It will begin in North China Mission. She was convinced that the missionaries had fulfilled the conditions for revival found in 2 Chronicles 7.14. In 1932, about 40 Christians were meeting in the town of North China for prayer four times a day beginning at 5 a.m. Believers were convicted of sin. Two men repented of, of hating each other. This is the prayer meeting. Okay. Love was strong and deep. Joy abounded. When revival came, more people were born again than in any previous year in North China. One missionary estimated about 3,000 people came to Christ in his town. 
pastors, missionaries, and Bible women experienced a deeper Christian life than they had ever known before. A spirit of prayer was poured out on the church. People loved to pray. Many times, prayer meetings lasted two or three hours. The prayers were short. They were fervent and sometimes tearful. Children's, listen, children's prayers led to the salvation of their parents and their teachers. You want revival? You want revival? Come on, Sandy. You want revival? Begins at the altar. Begins at the altar. Listen, I know. I know, Pastor, you... You blew it today, man. You, went, you got long-winded. You got tongue-tied. You couldn't see what you were saying. But I'm going to tell you this. You want revival to hit these altars right now. Come on. Join me. You want, let the Spirit of loving God fall upon you right now. Let Him minister healing water to your repentant heart. Let Him pour His water of, 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 of freshness over you. Listen, we got four months left of this year. Why don't we go ahead and say, let's have 2020 vision for the rest of the year. You want revival? Let's find a place. Humble yourself. Pray. Seek His face. Turn from your wicked ways. And God will hear us and heal our land. You want revival? You want revival, church? You really want revival. You want what it takes. It's the altar. It's the altar. It's the altar. It begins at the altar. It begins at the altar. If there's no place here, find a place and just get along with God for a few moments. It's about revival. It's the altar. It begins at His altar. Back at His altar. We want revival. Do we want revival? Do we want revival? Father, in the name of Jesus, revive us, send revival, send revival in our hearts, send revival, send revival, send revival, Lord, not a series of sermons, but a life-changing transformation in our minds, in our hearts, in our homes. in our jobs, our communities. God, if revival don't change our city, then we haven't been revived. Revival's not to just a, I know, I know they talk about reviving the dead, and, but revival spiritually is not, not for just dead people, it's for people to get more aware, people to get more involved, people to get more acquainted. Revival's not just the time for a, a, a week of a, a groups of meetings. It's a time of cleansing, restoring, refreshing ourselves, getting more. God, revival. We want revival. God, not, not what Brother Todd's bringing. He's going to bring powerful words, I know. He's going to bring anointed messages. I know you're going to anoint the worship. You're going to anoint our, us being here. You're going to, you're going to meet us here. I, I know, God, the great things are going to happen. But I'm talking about ch a change of life, a change of attitude, a change of heart. I'm talking about a change that affects those that we come in contact with. A revival. A revival that makes us aware that Jesus is coming. A revival that makes us aware that God is wanting us to repent. He's wanting our hearts. He's wanting everything about us. He's wanting it to be deep. Take us deep. Take us to better places, higher places, deep in His Word, but higher places. A ministry that 
so full of the power of God. Well, revival's delayed because your church is unrepentant. The revival's delayed because your church won't seek your face. We still want to seek your hand. Revival's delayed because we want it to be about us. We have our own agendas that we want to accomplish. We set a goal for how many in attendance, how much offering, how many souls, and how many this and how many that, instead of just letting the Spirit of God have His way because His number is going to be greater than ours anyway. Revival church begins in the altar. God, we repent. We humble ourselves before you this morning. We repent. We seek your face. We turn from our wicked ways and we ask you to heal our land. God, everybody has their own mentality, their own, their own definition of revival and their own thinking of what this virus is going to do, what it's not going to do. But God, as your church repents, as your church humbles itself, as your church seeks your face, as your church turns from her wicked ways, then you can heal the land. Then you can heal the land. Then you can heal the land. There's a tarrying for revival and the church is to delay. But it's time now. It's time now, church. It's time now. It's time now. It's time. The time we have left for 2020 we can be the can be the best time we've had all year can be the best time we've had all year. We can spend it in doubt and fear. We can spend it in confusion and chaos. We can spend it in wandering or we can spend it being victorious in revival. We can have revival in a messed up world, absolutely. We can have revival. If you read where some of these great things happened in the Bible, it was during some chaotic times. We can have the best outpouring of the Spirit of God the next four months of this year than we've had in years. Are we hungry? Are we hungry? Do we want it? Now, some of you were getting away. Some of you were standing up. Some of you were still praying. and You do what you need to do. You're not on nobody's clock. We're on God's time. Can no longer make it about what I want, what I think, what I... No. God, is your will. And your will is for your church to be revived. Not to what it was, but to what you want it to be. For what you intended it to be all along. Maybe how it started. you still pray <laughs> I'm going to close with one more statement it's not in my notes but the Lord just dropped it in my spirit
Not only does the church need to come to the altars, corporately, but the church also needs your personal altar, your personal place of prayer, your God's people, your personal place of healing. And here's the final statement. Not only as churches being built without altars, homes are losing them as well. That's what I thought this was on revival. Can't have it without an altar. You want your home to be revived? Dust your altar off. And get back up on your knees. It is not. It is not. And I'm not being critical. It is not the school system or the government to teach my child how to pray. It's my job. If they're not going to do it at home, they're sure not going to do it at school. Because the school is not going to encourage it. It's not popular, Tim. You're laughed at, you're made fun of. Children are brutal. They have no filters. And they see you pray and they laugh at you and they mock at you. But most children don't want that. So they won't do it. Parents encourage them. Grandparents encourage them. Brittany was here a minute ago. My grandson, he, and I know most of the kids, they, they're in his video games. And, 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 you know, he's got, thank God he goes back to school on October the 19th. I'm not there a lot, but I come in and see the end of it. So I can only see what the beginning was like. But a lot of times I'll ask him, what are you doing? I'm on break. Break from what? From class. I said, okay. You take more breaks than any kid I know. Well, we're on break. I've already done that assignment. And they're, and they're, they're, they're the ones that have it are doing it. And they got this thing now that if he's done everything by by Thursday, he signs on Friday morning for attendance, and if everything's done, he's off. And he's, man, he's been off a lot, and he's, he goes, they're going to do that when I go back to school, I get Fridays off? I said, no, 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 no. But I'll ask him, I'm like, Lincoln, you know who this is, and I'll give a Bible character. And he'll look. Yes, Papa. Oh, you do know who that is? Yes, Papa. What did he do? He killed this big old giant. Cool. If you'd have said he did something else, if we was about to get the Bible out, we was going to have a lesson. And now, and even now, if I show him pictures, I'm looking at something on Facebook. Somebody sends me a video, and somebody sent me some stuff about, uh, you know, just some scenes from, of, of what the crucifixion would look like. And he'd see, and you know, the Passion of the Christ, if he even sees a preview you know, during Easter time, whatever, it just it wrecks him. And I'm like, don't ever let that feeling leave you. If that scene don't bother you, then we need to talk, son. Listen, it's, it's our responsibility. It's not, it's not theirs. They got to pray. They need to understand that there's an importance for the altar in the home, in your life, and in the church. We want revival? If you're serious... If we're serious, church, God's going to come. Listen, 5 o'clock tonight, we'll be back in here for prayer. We'll start service at 6. I'm excited. I can't wait. My wife says she's coming tonight because she wants to be here. I'm not going to tell her no. I'll just see how she feels. But God bless you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for our guests today. We're glad you're with us. I pray you had an encounter that you won't forget. And uh, if you feel, if you're up to it, come back and be with us next week. Come back tonight. 
5 o'clock for prayer, 6 o'clock service. God bless you. Oh, want to say something? Guys, we're not going to have the men's breakfast Saturday. Uh, Ken's bailing out on this. I'm just kidding. He's got to, actually, he's got to work. He's got to cover for his boss. So we're not going to have a men's breakfast this month. We'll resume next month, and we'll give you more details. So God bless.